Good evening. Good evening. It's great to see so many people here. Um, so welcome to On This Day in History, Why Do Anniversaries Matter? Uh, we are, we'd like to extend our thanks as the History Department to the Department for running this in conjunction with Remembrance Week, uh, which is a week of events that the History Society have organised questioning how we remember, why we remember, and even asking should we remember. So this evening our panel will be questioning the importance of anniversaries in the modern day. Uh, and, it's, and it is with great pleasure that I'd like to introduce Professor Weinstein this evening who will be chairing this evening's debate. Helen is a history of contemporary culture whose research focuses on how narratives of the past function in our society, the ways in which the public engage with the past and how history shapes identities in the present. As an experienced broadcaster and producer, Helen has produced over 80 documentaries and with her team at HistoryWorks TV has been heavily involved in the work commemorating the centenary of the First World War next year. Beyond media projects, she is committed to empowering academics and women speakers through a variety of mentoring schemes, and Helen has also been involved in engagement projects with British museums that aim to create a better dialogue between academic knowledge, curatorial practice and the public. She is now a research professor, a uh, research professor as a fellow of Clare Hall at the University of Cambridge, where she is completing uh, a book entitled the Public Past, History, Meaning and Society. So welcome to Sheffield. Thank you. Um, Thanks very much. Thank you very much. So this is a, a very auspicious week to come and have this debate. Um, the title is On This Day, Why Do Anniversaries Matter? We're not going to have a, a timing clock, but I think people are going to kind of swiftly give you some kind of sound bites from their own research records and, and reflect um, about why anniversaries matter. As we go through, we want to make this quite conversational, so do think of questions that you'd like to ask um, so that we can have some kind of debate at the end. I mean, I think from my perspective, from being involved in broadcasting, when I first went into the BBC after I'd been a research historian, I was amazed that everybody had on their desk, pretty much, at Radio 4 This Is, a little book that was called On This Day. And it, so you could look up November the 5th, if you didn't know that date, and get a little bio. I mean, now, you know, particularly now I've joined Twitter, we're kind of bombarded with these shouts to the past that there's something interesting there. And I think there's a real concern of academic historians, but also some of the programme makers within media organisations, that there are these kind of shout-outs to say that think certain dates in the past matter. We all know as historians the date doesn't matter. It has to have the context, the understanding. Otherwise, there's nothing to kind of play with. But, you know, if you look at any broadsheet, if you're trying to get your, particularly your book, pushed to the public, you know, in con our contemporary UK society, you know, anniversaries do work. They work for the media industry. They become a very kind of commercial, hallmark-style kind of way of commemorating the past and it's great that we're here today I think this week when there really is a, a, an, an important commemoration that we will all be thinking about a lot in the UK the next few years and that is the commemoration of the Great War. At the BBC we've got something amazingly hard to think about really which is something like 2,500 hours of programming going to go out in the next four years that's a lot of programming and quite a lot of it's going to be local so I'm really pleased we're also going to be talk about the significance of the local we're going to talk tonight I think about different kinds of cultural constructions of identity and commemoration so that we're not going to stay within this paradigm of kind of the BBC media kind of the now and um, and tackle some pressing issues for us as historians so I'd like to first ask Lydia to speak and I'm going to introduce you one at a time if that's okay. So for those of you who've not met Lydia Rollison yet, Lydia is a third year studying history here at Sheffield and she's been working with Amy Ryle on the AHRC project which is called The Significance of the Centenary Project and her summer project this year focused on the question, what is understood to be the worth of centennial commemoration? At what level and by whom? And she's been looking at recent um, centenaries over the past five to six years and how they've been celebrated. And I think one of the things I was really excited about was to hear about the participatory part of that project. Because as historians, particularly in museums and academia and the media, we're all interested in how we can have kind of user-generated 
type projects and I think your work with History Pin something I'm going to be very interested to learn about from you tonight and, and how that's worked as a local uh, community project. Should I stand up for? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm um, formal but stand up. <laughs> um, I'm Lydia, so like Helen just said I worked on a summer project over the summer, obviously, um, which was what is understood to be worthy of centennial commemoration at what level and by whom and so we're trying to which Amy, who is a supervisor, she's been working with a group on the significance of the centenary. And so sort of looking into interrogating the intellectual basis on which centenary commemorations and celebrations are initiated and executed. So really looking into where this cult of centenary has come from, why everyone seems to think that 100 years is such an important thing. Um, so I was looking over quite a recent period, pretty much between 2006 and next year, looking forwards to the World War I centenary. Looking over Twitter, Google searches, local museums, different organisations. I spoke to the BBC, I spoke to a lot of people. And um, the findings that I had was sort of, so I was looking to find, so yeah, what is worthy of centenary motion, what level and by whom. And something that really jumped out to me straight away, something that Helen mentioned, is the sort of commercial aspect that's become um, of centenaries. I mean, one of the first things that I found was 100 years, 100 goals from Chelsea FC, <laughs> which sold thousands and thousands of copies, as I could find. Centenary kits, all these things. And there wasn't... What I thought was really interesting is there was very little discussion of the history of the club and the change that it had gone through over the past 100 years and was just really pushing towards this commercial gain. Um, not just in sort of more local things, in the celebration of the discovery of Machu Picchu in Peru, or the rediscovery, um, the Peruvian Tourism Agency was pushing it as this huge thing for selling, trying to draw people in again, sort of ignoring a lot of the cultural importance and things that have happened over the past 100 years. And really this can be seen across everywhere if you look at the centenary of the sinking of the Titanic, which has been tied into the regeneration of this town in Ireland called Cove, which is where the tit was where the last place the Titanic set in, and they plunged £7 billion into the rejuvenation of this town, which used to be this enormous, important port, and has just sort of gone to seed ever since. Um, so, yeah, this commercialisation really sort of dominated at the beginning at what level things were celebrated. Um, tying into the commercialisation, something that I've sort of talked about a little bit, the rejuvenation, so we can be seen further across the world, as in Canberra, which uh, what a lot of people don't really realise is the capital of Australia was deemed deathly dull at 100. And so the project, over, which and it's their 100 year anniversary of the founding of Canberra this year, and um, there have been all these studies into looking into questioning the people of Australia, what they thought of it, and whether they believed it was an important place, and really it just came in lagging behind Brisbane, Melbourne, and obviously mostly Sydney. And so they'd been plunging, again, billions and billions of dollars into trying to rejuvenate it and make it better. The same can be seen in across Wales with the celebration next year of the birth of Dylan Thomas, um, looking to create a sustainable trail beyond 2014. So really the centenary has just become used as a hook because a celebration of these important things and these important people could really be held at any time. But using a centenary really seems to be able to make it reach um, a wider audience because of its, usually it's really involved in the media and more recently social media as well. And this um, use in technology and through the media has been really important in choosing the what has become um, worthy of centennial commemoration. Particularly, I had a look into what was going on with World War I, um, because it seems to be aimed a lot at the younger generation, because maybe it's something that isn't necessarily thought about. With, I don't know if any of you have heard, but the government is planning to pay for two children from every, um, state, from every school in the country to go and visit the battlefields and the Imperial War Museum is looking to create something called a Facebook for the Fallen, where they create a Facebook profile for all of the um, fallen soldiers. So really trying to connect with um, the younger generation. And this use of technology and social media really has dominated at what level things have become to be celebrated at. Pretty much any centenary that you look at will have a Facebook profile, a Twitter profile, I'm sure lots of you found this today by seeing a Facebook event. And this has just come to dominate sort of all the interaction between a lot of maybe academics and the wider public. Um, in 2009, when they were celebrating, celebrating this um, quincentenary of the coronation of Henry VIII, we had an I Am Henry Twitter page, which is when he was Henry preparing for coronation and him tweeting about what he was going through in preparation. <laughs> also, at what level 
which has been seen through, especially through World War One, but also in this year through um, the centenary of Benjamin Britten and also Richard Wagner, the composers, which can be seen across the world. And what's really amazing about centenaries, I think, is the in international quality they inspire. It brings people together that maybe wouldn't necessarily be brought together and um, makes them really think carefully about the way that they remember and the way that maybe there might be different narratives about the same event. And I think that's a really important thing and something that makes centenaries so important and so special. Um, for a while. But again, like Helen said, the thing that really astounded me is the sheer quantity of centenaries that can be found everywhere, not only at a national and international level, but at a local level, the way that people remember specific dates or events and things to them, I thought was really amazing, and it really does inspire this community feeling and seem to bring people together. Um, and finally, something, the thing that I was sort of, was the outcome of my project is I made um, a collection on this web, this really good website, it's called History Pin, or it's all one word, historypin.com, which is where you can create collections or tours, and sort of you create like um, a map so you can pin things on at specific places and specific times, so you can create timelines or like a physical map and follow things around. <coughs> and on there I was able to document a lot more, I was nearly 50 of the centenaries that I had investigated into, which I couldn't really talk about this evening. And on there you really get a feel for the local and the international importance of centenaries. I mean, it just seems that anyone and anything celebrates 100 years. Maybe it's just because our world is so fast moving, I don't know. But I think, from my research, I just think they're a really important thing. And there's just one final question that I sort of that came out of mine was the lack of the celebration in science, which I thought was really interesting, and in scientific discoveries and in the births and deaths of important scientists, which I think really have been overlooked by our media. Darwin. Mm. We did have Darwin. Yes. <laughs> but um, I was looking into the work of... of Sorry. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, a lot of the um, a lot of stuff on Marie Curie got quite overlooked, mm. except mm. maybe in France, even though it's such an important international yeah. thing. And I just thought that was an interesting point, maybe mm. to end on. Mm. Else to thank so you. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. really good things to think with here as a group I think of, of being able to go from the local to the global that so often connecting to our kind of ancestors which is what any society does happens on a local level it happens within your own family through the marking of birthdays etc but what happens now in our very connected wor world in an exciting way possibly when things get global but then I guess we'll come to how do then states use anniversaries for their own purposes. And I think November the 5th is such an important thing to think about this week. You know, that was a state-sponsored commemoration. Uh, it was the Mayor of London who was paying for the apprentices you know, to come out and drink beer and to light bonfires and make effigies of the Pope. You know, It was very much a, yeah, a state-sponsored commemoration. And now it looks like the Catholics kind of won out in that Reformation struggle because we've all been doing Halloween probably a lot bigger <laughs> in the UK the last couple of years than we have been doing Penny for the Guy, etc. So thank you very much. That was a great start. And next, we're going to turn to Amy Ryle. And Amy um, is the Faculty of Arts and Humanities External Engagement Projects Officer, uh, but has uh, quite a long track record of working in museums and heritage education. I think that's a really important voice to bring to the table tonight. And her interest in anniversary stems from working at the Imperial War Museum on the Past Your Future project. And I remember that was a very intensive commemoration education project, wasn't it, at all levels? Was it primary, yeah, secondary, right through, yeah, right through, and right adult adults, ed? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, it's, and it's very much the learning from that project, which I think is shaping the government commemoration now, isn't it? <laughs> so it started really with cool. the project on the Second World War, and now you're going to be taking us to your experiences of the shaping of the First World War commemoration. Thank you very much, Amy. Go ahead. So um, I think it's clear from what Lydia's already said that anniversaries do matter for different reasons, from very personal reasons, right up to quite political ones in fact. And um, my work on this significance of the Centenaries Research Network has highlighted um, that everything and anything can be commemorated. Um, and I think Lydia's made that, that point as well, somewhere by somebody. Um, and social media really helps with that, it, it can make that difference. Once you have a look at Twitter, on Facebook, on the internet, it's amazing what is actually commemorated. Um, and this year, so 2013, we've seen events commemorating and celebrating stainless steel, 
Benjamin Britten, Aston Martin, the Medical Research Council, Canberra, Chelsea Flower Show, the Golden Retriever Club, numerous mm. golf clubs, the opening of Kettering's Alfred East Gallery, Swansea City Football Club, I could go on, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these centenaries. Um, if you've had a look at Twitter today, you might, you might have noticed that it's 95 years since Wilfred Owen was killed, um, and there is a Wilfred Owen Association which was set up in 1989 to commemorate his life and work, and they put an immemorial notice in the Times every year um, to commemorate that. So it's a really big thing. Anniversaries clearly matter. Um, and they're used as a hook. That's very definitely clear as well. Uh, museums in particular, my background, uh, as Helen said, is in museums, um, and they use anniversaries as a, as a hook very effectively. Um, next year you'll see a plethora of First World War exhibitions um, here in Sheffield and elsewhere in the UK and in the world. Um, and the subsequent four years we'll see a lot of anniversaries of the First World War commemorated. Um, Imperial War Museums are using the centenary to launch a big redevelopment of the site at Lambeth Road. So the First World War um, galleries are being revamped but that's just the start of a much bigger master plan. Um, and it's giving many organisations the opportunity to collect either physical objects, you might have seen some appeals in newspapers or other places for these, or stories. Um, Lydia mentioned the Lives of the Great War project. This is a, a kind of crowdsourcing project of Facebook for the Fallen um, that is appealing for First World War stories. So the Imperial War Museum has a very large collection of photographs and documents relating to men and women who fought um, or otherwise contributed to the First World War and they're trying to find out more about them using um, the general public. The Guardian, today I was reading an article, um, have also put out a similar appeal for, um, for information about First World War stories. The media, as Helen says, love an anniversary. It's very easy for them to fill their pages with pre-planned events, um, dates that they don't have to really um, try too hard to, to get material for. So that's, that's one of the, the things that why anniversaries matter, I think. Um, the government love an anniversary as well. They've talked about the First World War centenary as, as this uniting force for the nation in much the same way that the Jubilee and the Olympics were in 2012. Um, continuity across these events is provided by a woman called Jenny Waldman who um, masterminded the Cultural Olympiad and is doing the same for the cultural um, centenary cultural program. So that's quite interesting, I think, that this, this uh, they, they've linked them together. They're very different events, clearly, but there's that link there. And it's also clear from the plans that centenaries have an educative role. Um, we've mentioned the um, plan to take two school children from every school in England to the battlefields, not Wales or Scotland or Northern Ireland, just England at the moment. Um, but that's a 5.3 million project. That's big money uh, that's been put into that. And Maria Miller, the Culture Secretary, has referred to the marking of the centenary as an opportunity to bring its importance to life for younger generations. So this education role is very definitely um, a reason why anniversaries matter. Um, there's also been a report by a think tank called Bright Futures, which found that 85% of the public that were asked, obviously, supported the statement that British school children don't know enough about British history and that the centenary of the First World War is a good moment to encourage them to learn more. So clearly people are looking at anniversaries for these, um, these reasons. And it's about trying to make these connections with young people and the wider public that make anniversaries matter. Making what was once a personal anniversary, so when the First World War had first finished, it was about commemorating people who had died that you knew it's turned into a public anniversary through the passage of time as, as people um, are no longer here. And what we're trying to do, what seems to be happening, is that it's being returned to the personal. So we're making those personal connections again. Um, I think first centenaries then perhaps matter more than subsequent multiples because of this personal connection. And it can be made much more convincingly. Although the last British veterans of the First World War died in 2009, um, there are still people today who remember First World War veterans, family members, perhaps members of their community, um, and they can relay their stories. So we've still got a personal connection. It's still within living memory. Um, at the 60th anniversary of the Second World War, 
much was made of the fact that one in five people alive in 2005, which was when that anniversary was, had lived through the war and therefore there were many personal connections to that conflict. So it's about making um, it personal again. And I think anniversaries matter to ordinary people because of this. Our connections to people like Jack Mudd, William Tickle, these are names you might see over the next four years, Betty Stevenson, Harold Brown, Evelina Haverfield, all people that participated in the First World War and whose stories are held by Imperial War Museums. Um, they matter, I think, because if you go to Belgium, as I once did, uh, with a group of school children and attend a small village remembrance Sunday service in a local cemetery, those school children were thanked by the, by the Belgian villagers for the role that their ancestors sometimes in a broad sense, and for some um, in a much more definite connection, played in protecting Belgium during the First World War. It's not about learning from the past. I don't really think anniversary is about learning from the past, but it's about realising that we're a small part of what will become the past, um, and, and this making us look differently at how we do things today. Thank you. Thank you. Lovely. And I guess the kind of nugget that I would share with you is that there's a lot of fear too about this remembrance of the First World War in the media and that the public are going to get scared of uh, really getting involved because there's just too much of it and nobody understands it. So one of the things we've shown at, in the BBC quite a lot is the sequence from Horrible Histories of why did the First World War start? It seems to encapsulate it really well. But if you don't have the personal connectedness, it's really, really hard to get people to engage. And I guess now with all the audience research and everything that goes on, we know on BBC One Hour bits of TV that if we spend the money on drama rather than having a, a presenter-led narrative for a history show, although it will be far more expensive, we'll also recoup it in terms of audience. That as soon as you have that emotional, up close and personal telling of the past, you go from say one to two million an hour of audience in the UK who would watch that programme to something upwards of six, eight, ten million. You know, look at recently who do you think you are, the kind of audience share that that's getting in the audience numbers. It is huge. I mean, it's kind of good for us as historians because it's, it's, some, it's some touching of toes with the wider public and then you can tempt them into kind of a deeper understanding, I think. And I, I think next we'll go to another speaker on the First World War and then we're going to go into other kind of cultural realms which I think will be useful, very useful for us today. So I'd like to ask next um, Dr Helen Smith to speak and I think many of you will have seen some of her tweets through the new project, the centenary project, Sheffield 1914, Lives and Headlines. And this is a great new kind of collaborative partnership project that brings together academic staff, the Sheffield Star newspaper, and members of the public to come together to collaborate and work and dig deep um, to work together on the experiences of Sheffielders in the Great War. So she's going to talk today about the importance of recognising and understanding regional differences. This is not all flat, it's not all the same everywhere. There are very particular histories in the local region that need to be attended to. Thanks, Helen. That's really exactly what I want to speak about today, is to sort of speak about the importance of the regional and the local within all this. And this feeds in nicely to what Lydia and Amy have already said and what Helen mentioned there, to talk about you know, getting that sort of personal um, attachment to an issue um, and to encourage people to get involved with it. And often a really nice way to do that is to do that through um, a local project and to think about um, what, for in this case, the First World War meant to people in Sheffield. Um, and I think that, that is, it is important because it, there can be quite a dominant national narrative um, when we're talking about anniversaries, you know, as, as has already sort of been highlighted uh, by the speakers, um, and you know, governments and, and states can sort of try and hijack that in order to present you know a particular type of story or a particular viewpoint. And the way that we can sort of counteract that and challenge that as historians is to sort of blend in these local issues into a wider narrative. So for the project that, that I'm working on, um, Sheffield 1914 Lives and Headlines, um, as Helen mentioned, it's a collaborative project. So academics in the university 
um, with the Sheffield Star newspaper and then we're also inviting members of the public to actually contribute as well. So it's an exercise in recovery in a way. Um, I'm doing research into archival material with the Sheffield Star to sort of recover people's stories from Sheffield in 1914 and see what pressing issues were for them. But what we're also doing is inviting people to get in touch with the Star and with us to sh sort of share those sort of personal stories as well. So there's the archival aspect and also collecting new information um, and potentially even objects as well that may have been lost. So why is this important? Um, it's important um, because it sort of forms part of the shared um, culture of a city. So, you know, Sheffield, as I'm sure you, you've all sort of seen with living here, it's got a very distinct personality. And I think some of that can actually be linked to history. And this gives us an excellent opportunity to sort of get people involved with that even more. Um, and Sheffield in particular will be a really interesting case study to look at as we go on throughout the project because not only did Sheffield have sort of the traditional um, uh, sort of narratives that we can come to expect in commemorating the war, so Powell's Battalion and lots of brave men who went off to fight, but you also have sort of quite contested um, histories and ideas relating to the First World War encapsulated in the city as well. So Sheffield's a steel city as you all know and what that meant is that the majority of men who were working in the steelworks at the time were in a reserved occupation and they didn't have to go and fight. And actually, a large number of men didn't go and fight. So for a lot of people living in Sheffield, the war was actually a fairly good time. You know, wages were high, employment was high. And that is certainly not the narrative that we've come to expect when we're looking at commemorating the war. So what we need to look, think about is, you know, those people's experiences could potentially be marginalised. So it gives us an opportunity to think about the home front and what that meant um, for people at the time and for us to remember that as well. Along with that, we've also got Sheffield as sort of at the forefront of arms manufacture with the steel industry as well. So that can be quite a difficult thing for us to navigate when we're looking at sort of commemorating or thinking about the war in Sheffield because you've got the city providing the shells that allowed the war to continue. So depending on your point of view, that might be a positive thing or it might be a negative thing. Another interesting point that we want to sort of look at that's coming out through the research that we're doing um, is that a very you know, a famous pacifist lived near Sheffield. So Edward Carpenter, the socialist, lived near Sheffield. Um, and he had very strong views about war and the fact that he didn't think the war should go on. And those views were actually influential within the city as well. So just on the surface of all that research, it brings up all these issues that we can discuss and that the wider public are actually starting to get interested in and to work with. So we've gone outside the dominant narrative of, of war and remembering war, and it's allowing us to sort of ask some more difficult questions and to think about what those questions might mean. So I think in that, from that point of view, the anniversary here is very important, and it gives us that springboard and that hook that, that Amy and Lydia have mentioned to actually get people thinking about some of these more difficult questions. Um, and to sort of finish up here, I think if we're asking the question of why anniversaries matter um, or whether this is still relevant, the sort of response that we're already getting from members of the public through the star um, points to the fact that it does and people in this city do care about the war and about how we will choose to sort of remember it or talk about it. So we're getting emails and phone calls through the project um, wanting to know what we will do and giving us suggestions for how we might want to think about the war and mark this anniversary. So I think that in itself um, is an excellent point to finish on really. So it matters, to, it matters to me academically, I'm sure it matters to a lot of you guys academically as well, but it also does seem to matter um, to people in this city. Um, and they are very um, vocal in how they think the war should be actually remembered. And that's something that within this project we're wanting to take on board and to work with. Um, to make sure that we can keep challenging sort of a national narrative and make sure that Sheffield sort of gets its place within the commemorations. So, thank you. Thank you. I guess a, a reflection on that would be the IWM new project. I've, brought, I've been brought, sent up here with some 
CDs to use for teaching too, called Who's Remembrance, which has just been published with an AHRC funded project with IWM and BBC being a bit involved in that with National Archives. And really asking the questions of to help answer the audience research with the public, which is all we know about this war, it's, it's muddy, it's trenches, it's poppies, and it's very white, it's about white men. Mm. So who, who's actually involved? I mean, there are four million non-white people involved. I think for cities like Sheffield and Bradford, it's really important to attend to that mm. history. In York, we have Gurkha brigades. You know, there, there, there's a lot, uh, there are other kinds of ways in, and there are all the women workers in all the, in all the industrial plants up here, which are, and their lives were just so changed by the war. So trying to get into feminist um, accounting of this uh, war, I think, is really important. And I guess one of the things I was wondering as I was coming up here on the train was, and I came through Hillsborough, the, the Hillsborough stop on that new tram. Hillsborough, what an, what an important anniversary that's been for the city of Sheffield. You know, when in fact, rather than having a state-sponsored anniversary marking, it's been used to speak truth to power here, hasn't it? Yeah. It's been a really important marker, and I'd, I'd, be, I'd be very interested to see how that kind of comes through in your research and the ways that you work locally, because anniversary marking here has very specific significance. Well, next we're going to a very troubled place through the, uh, through the wars. Very, very interesting research. I'd like to next introduce uh, Kive Nikdovade. Have I pronounced your name right? Ish. <laughs> hope so. Um, who's a lecturer here in modern history. She's a historian of political violence and of modern Ireland, particularly the important revolutionary period between 1912 and 1923. So she's going to talk very much about Ireland's decade of centenaries. Um, and I, I've been told that at the, um, the First World War um, meeting of Prots and the Cats for the uh, Peace Alliance, mm. that, that that would never really happened if they hadn't gone together on a mission to the war graves. And that there was yeah. a lot of yeah. interesting negotiations that went yeah. on between the Paisleys and mm -hmm. the IRA chiefs that were just were never possible mm -hmm. on home territory. Uh, so I'm very interested in your research and I can't think of a place, uh, particularly Northern Ireland, where this centenary is going to matter more. Yeah. So thank you very much for speaking today. Okay, um, so turning from a sort of exploration of centenaries more broadly and in Britain, I think interesting in terms of thinking about how the centenary of the Great War has been approached in Ireland and in Britain is there is a mutual sort of hands-off. Um, Ireland doesn't really feature in the official British um, narrative of the commemoration of the Great War and Britain doesn't really feature in what is emerging in terms of the official Irish narrative of the Great War. Um, so the sort of question we were asked is do anniversaries matter? In Ireland they absolutely do matter. Um, every <coughs> summer in Northern Ireland is um, marked or disfigured, depending on your perspective, by uh, parades and commemorations, commemorate, uh, remembering various historical events. Um, in contrast to Britain, which is gearing up for its commemorative splurge next year, Ireland's already two years into this decade of commemorations, which marks the anniversary of the series of events which led to the partial independence of part of the island. These span world war, rebellion, revolution, civil war and partition. And after 40 years of violence in Northern Ireland and the fragile peace which has emerged, the prospect of troubling the waters by stirring up old hatreds and old resentments has set a difficult challenge, I think, for those in charge of directing the commemorative programme. And there is quite an extensive programme. Um, multiple working and advisory groups exist with significant academic input and a whole plethora of events, conferences, historical reenactments and his official commemorations has been drawn up. Um, the Taoiseach Enda Kenny and the Prime Minister David Cameron issued a joint statement recognising the opportunity to explore and reflect on key episodes of our past and emphasised the need to do so in a spirit of historical accuracy, mutual respect, inclusiveness and reconciliation. And this top-down approach, I think, speaks to a certain amount of official anxiety about ownership of how Ireland commemorates her historical past and which version of that past is commemorated. And there's ample reason for this anxiety. 
In an influential um, interpretation put forward by Conor Cruz O'Brien, the outbreak of violence in Northern Ireland in 1968 and 69 was directly linked to the 50th anniversary of the Easter Rising in 1966. Um, the frequent calls by Irish politicians that young men and women should um, emulate and fulfil the ideals of the men and women of 1916 was seen by many, not unreasonably, to have contributed to the spiralling violence in Belfast and Derry in the late 60s and early 70s. Um, in recent times, the resurgence of dissident, the activities of dissident Republicans, um, if any of you have been to Dublin recently, or in fact all over Ireland, um, there's graffiti which is cropping up all over the place um, around remember 1916, what was 1916 for, let us rise and these are um, sort of I suppose guerrilla graffiti um, being put up by dissident republican groups. Um, on the other hand there's the increasingly contentious culture war in Northern Ireland over flags and other vehicles of uh, political identity um, and all of this underlines something of what is at stake here. It's not merely an agreed and collective act of remembrance, and I think that's where what the decade, of, where the decade of centenaries in Ireland differs fundamentally from what um, is unfolding in Britain. Although I was very interested to hear Helen's um, complication of the kind of official narrative of one happy nation marching off to the trenches together. Um, so, what will the Irish narrative be for the decade of centenaries, and which anniversaries will matter? One of the most interesting aspects of how it has unfolded so far is the increased prominence of labour issues in official and popular commemorative events. This is in stark comparison to the 50th anniversary in 1966 when labour didn't really feature at all. The centenary of the 1913 lockout, marked in August of this year, was attended by the President of Ireland, senior government figures and attracted a large audience in central Dublin. This is partly attributable to the fact that the Irish Labour Party are in coalition, but it also, I think, speaks to the relevance the lockout has to the Ireland of today, the Ireland of the bailout, the Ireland of austerity, at a time when workers in Dublin and elsewhere are suffering, when industrial magnates have been replaced by, villain, by bankers as the villains of the peace, and when the fig leaf of Irish economic independence has been swept away, the issues at stake in 1913 are thrown into sharp relief. So I think contemporary political developments can fundamentally shape and, and alter what it is we remember of our past and how we choose to mark it. There is, I think, um, perhaps a danger of foregrounding the big and exciting landmark events and in so doing perhaps underplaying the gentler, more imperceptible shifts during this decade. Um, a further de danger relates to the more difficult aspects of commemoration, especially when the same event is remembered very differently. So the partition of Ireland in 1920 will be commemorated in a very different fashion in Unionist and Nationalist Ireland. For one group, this, this event um, signifies the, their continued survival as a distinct ethno-political uh, ethno bloc, and it is the foundation of their state. For the other group, uh, partition represents the sundering of a nation and the mutilation of its national territory. So I think that's going to be a very tricky year. 2020 is going to be a tricky one to manage. Um, from this perspective, something like 1916 will actually be quite straightforward in terms of commemorations. Nationalist Ireland will remember the Rising over here, and Unionist <coughs> Ireland will remember the Somme way over here. And this, uh, the separate spheres in terms of how the communities seem to be operating and navigating this decade of commemorations is something which I think undermines this rationale of reconciliation which was presented in the official government mm -hmm. communique. So far, reconciliation appears to be limited to the government, the Dublin government providing funding for unionist events. That's not, I mean, that shouldn't be underestimated. That's a good thing. We should have more of that. But I think if, if we want to think about what reconciliation actually means, we need to go beyond mere sort of financial support. Um, so just in finishing, what of historians in this decade in Ireland? As I mentioned earlier, there is um, a significant academic presence on advisory panels, north and south. I think there's a special council of Irish university teachers who um, advise both governments. 
Um, a job has just been advertised in UCD for a lecturer in this decade of commemorations. The opportunities for historians to participate in speaking engagements have multiplied. And there has been some very sophisticated work, I think, in both digital and audiovisual media around this decade of centenaries. There's a great project um, which is on a website, which is also on Twitter, called Century Ireland, which uh, covers the whole decade from 1913 to 23, and every month it releases um, a sort of virtual newspaper of events which happened in that month. It's worth following if you're interested in seeing what's happening. So getting involved in the age of impact is clearly something Irish historians are doing, but I think historians, it, it is our job to point out the possible tensions between commemorating and celebrating, and where the governments come down on, on, that, on that division I think is, is important. Um, a word of caution, I think this rush to participate, to be part of the commemoration, can lead to a, a flattening out of the complexities of historical research and a rather stifling consensus in terms of the sort of political narrative that, that the governments on the island of Ireland are trying to present. I think um, a, a flattening out and a kind of agreed version of the past is beneficial, but we as historians, I think, are more inclined to complicate uh, complicate matters and I think for historians, politicians and programme makers alike the challenge remains to try and capture the past in all of its confusion, all of its chaos and all of its complexity. Thank you. Kive, thank you very, very much. Really kind of interesting reflections there on the on these culture wars, both in the past and the ones to come, and, and so much to work with in terms of artistic, poetic, flag, ritual marching, music. There is so much that is kind of out there, isn't there, in the, in the culture to be kind of watched and studied and consumed, and, and uh, I think we'll all be wondering what the, what the future holds there. On the HRC, we've been uh, funding some of the projects and two being kind of interested to see how how the kind of public and the academic community mm. will come together because these are often one of the only ways in which academics get their voices into some places that they wouldn't often get them and I think that's something that within this discussion we might want to kind of pause to, to think about as well uh, and I think the Irish um, question is similar to the kind of uh, issues that were provoked in the UK and globally with the commemoration of the abolition of the slave trade in 1807. You know, what happens when we have contested traumatic pasts? Mm -hmm. um, and this doesn't mean that we shouldn't commemorate, but once it's an anniversary, the language of apology seems to come up. So I wondered whether you might want to reflect on that uh, a little bit later too. So next we have Tim. Tim Baycroft, I think many of you will know, is a senior lecturer in modern history, specialising in 19th century France. France is a whole nother place where we have very different working out of, I don't know if it's going to be cheese wars, certainly kind of regional <laughs> acorn pig wars I've heard about in somebody else's work from some of the uh, tensions that can arise over commemorations. So I think memory making is something you're going to tell us something about, particularly in the context of national identity and state building. So thank you very much, okay, Tim. Thanks. Um, right, so we were asked to talk about why do centenaries matter? And in time-honored tradition, I'm going to flip the question around. And I'm going to say that what really counts is for whom do anniversaries or centenaries matter? And my work on France has suggested an answer, which is that it matters for certain kinds of political groups who are, and this can be political in the very overt political sense or in the sense of someone with an agenda, trying to mobilize the past use commemoration and anniversary in order to achieve some kind of end. Now this may be a very big political end, like in the case of France, the creation of a republic or the restoration of the monarchy and the reofficialization of the Catholic Church as the uh, official church, or it may be something which is quite a bit smaller. Now in France there are a huge choice of possible events to commemorate in terms of, if we just talk with revolutions, there's 1789, 1830, 1848, and 1871, if you only count the ones that were successful, then there's a bunch that failed as well. 
And for each one of these anniversaries, you will get those trying to celebrate them, the positive side, and those trying to celebrate the negative side. So the centenary of the French Revolution in 1889, this is when they built the Eiffel Tower as a way to commemorate the centenary. So there's a very big, visible monument to the greatness of France as a republic. Meanwhile, you get counter-revolutionary memory, trying to remember all of the people, like the royal family, other sorts of aristocrats, who in fact were guillotined during the revolution. And the revolution ought to be commemorated as a uh, traumatic event full of terror and uh, epitomizing evil and degeneration and all sorts of things, which they opposed in 1889. Already, even when you get to the bicentenary in 1989, when this is well past uh, any kind of living memory, uh, even of sort of one's ancestors' ancestors, there was still a counter commemoration. It wasn't very big, it attracted a few hundred people as opposed to a few million people for the positive one, but it still existed, this rival sense. Another example is in 1996, they commemorated the 1500th anniversary. We were trying to figure out what the word for that was. And couldn't come up with it. The 1500th anniversary of the baptism of Clovis, which was the moment when France apparently, and we'll leave the aside as to whether this actually happened and so on, but this is when France became Christian, became Catholic. So the beginning of a Catholic vision of French history. And so a, quite a different sort of commemoration with quite a different political agenda. And I think that um, insofar as there's a lesson or, or something we can conclude <coughs> more generally is, it, one qu thing we can always look at is who is trying to do the commemoration and why? What is the reason behind that motivation? So if I can uh, risk some uh, early controversy, I can pick some examples from earlier today. If we say Sheffield needs to get itself on the map of commemoration of the First World War. Okay, so this is a municipal agenda to try to claim a bit of space and make sure that Sheffield is included in whatever commemorations are there. It will be interesting to see if there's some sort of pacifist organizations in Britain who say we shouldn't be commemorating the war at all and try to use this as a way to decry any commemorations and use that as a vehicle to further a pacifist agenda. But all of these sorts of agendas, like we saw with Northern Ireland, where in 19, 2020, there's already two sides quite clearly, like with the French Revolution, the pro and the counter, and it gets worked out slowly, but by mobilizing history. So I think this is not just about, um, I think what you had been talking at the beginning about cultural construction, not just cultural construction, it's actually political construction. <coughs> this is a discussion, the mobilization of cultural discourses or cultural events or cultural moments as a way to further certain kinds of political agendas. So to answer the question of why aren't we commemorating scientists, well, partly because it's in nobody's political interest. Darwin is, of course, one where there is still some hot politics about Darwin's science. But Marie Curie's science isn't something which anybody can gain from, and so they tend not to talk about it very much, it seems to me. Um, we made a joke at the beginning that the reason why centenaries really matter is because historians can sell more books. And this is one of the reasons why you'll get uh, centenaries. Benjamin Britten was mentioned. Of course, you can sell tickets to a concert of music for a centenary. It's very hard to tell, sell tickets to a, some kind of commemoration of a, a scientist. So I think that in, in those senses, either there's a political reason or there's an economic reason. And in each case, the people pushing the commemoration, uh, as opposed to those in the public who are receiving it and maybe following it or maybe not, depending on uh, whether they're swayed by the arguments, um, it's those that are pushing uh, that are the, the, the motive behind commemoration. So the reason they're important is because individuals want them to be important and think that by mobilizing commemorations, it can further a contemporary agenda. Thank you. I guess, I guess we have a little bit of a pause. One thing I, we hadn't kind of sorted out were the kind of rules on hashtagging and everything. I think the people with some devices in the room who might be able to track whether we're getting some questions in through the History Matters hashtag, because it would be very useful when we have a bit more of a discussion after everybody's spoken, if some of you 
could help by using some of the questions that come in you can amplify them and modify them and i'd like to warn you now that we have cameras at the moment that are facing this way recording everybody but when you ask a question if it's okay because we want to archive things can you um make it clear whether we can be allowed to record your voice or film you we've got a camera a roving camera so we can capture all the questions if you don't want to be involved in that if you can make that clear to me as chair it's nothing to do with these guys that will be helpful and i'll moderate is that you can always give in something on a piece of paper to me too here at the front so let's press on with our next two speakers i'd like to introduce next dr caroline dodds panic who's a lecturer in international history specializing in aztec indigenous american and atlantic history and as many of you will know her work on society and human sacrifice has focused on recovering subaltern forgotten voices and that's something within this anniversary commemoration landscape that we want to attend to today and caroline's particularly interested in understanding the ways in which anniversaries serve to create and reinforce dominant narratives of history. So the big question again, in this context, whose history are we remembering? Thank you, Caroline. Thank you. Um, and I mean, a lot of what people have said kind of relates to what I'm going to talk about as well. It's hard to be original this far through the panel. <laughs> I'll wonder, Envy Charles. Um, I guess for me, as an indigenous historian, what strikes me about anniversaries is how often they seem to serve a particular point of view. For me, in a lot of ways, it feels like the ultimate example of history being written by the victors. And the example that springs to mind, the one I want to talk about today, is the 12th of October, 1492, the day on which Columbus supposedly discovered America. I use the air quotes like this because, of course, there were a lot of people there when he got there. Um, now, the 12th of October is celebrated as a public holiday in a lot of different countries, has a lot of different names, but in the United States, it's Columbus Day. And for Italian Americans in particular, it is very much seen as part of their cultural heritage because Columbus was Genoese, he was Italian. Now, the 12th of October 1492 is clearly a historically significant moment. It is often seen as the beginning of the modern era, the symbolic start of the modern, globalised world, all those kinds of ideas, beginning of multiculturalism, Atlantic contact. So when in 1992 the quincentennial, the 500th anniversary of the discovery came around, unsurprisingly there were plans for huge events to commemorate and to celebrate the occasion. People were going to have parades, monuments. Columbus, Ohio, the largest city named after Columbus, as well as San Francisco, were going to have big reenactments of Columbus's landing with historic sailing ships and so on. <coughs> what actually happened was rather different. In direct opposition to the planned national celebrations, protests took place across the United States and elsewhere, marking the event as a day of mourning for the millions of Native Americans who died as a result of European violence and disease. Ships were used to block the reconstructions in the harbours, protesters turned up to stop parades, interrupt dedications, and so on. The problem is that the arrival of Columbus in the Americas, although doubtless a historically significant event, is also a very problematic symbol to choose. It not only marks the beginning of the modern Americas, but also the beginning of the decimation of indigenous populations. It's the beginning of the devastating transatlantic slave trade. It's essentially the beginning of the enormous and hugely destructive European empires. So this wasn't exactly an anniversary that everyone felt like celebrating. Really importantly, I think, this wasn't just a Native American issue. Many other non-white groups also felt that the national recognition of Columbus Day was symbolic of a larger national narrative which saw the history of America as principally the history of white Christian people. Because of this, people of all races and religions turned out to protest Columbus Day, and they were concerned about what this anniversary said about the way the, Amer uh, the, way the US was presenting its values, was presenting its own history. Columbus Day is clearly an anniversary that matters to people, coming back to the question, but why it matters depends enormously on what you understand it as symbolising. 
And as an Indigenous historian, I guess I think that we have to be really, really sensitive to those multiple meanings because there's a real danger that our choice of anniversary serves to affirm and reinforce narratives which speak much more to some people than they do <coughs> others. This is similar to what a few other people have actually said. I mean, Columbus Day has become increasingly politically incorrect. More and more people see it as glorifying a violent history of European colonial domination. But it's still an official American national holiday in all but four states. Even in places like South Dakota, who have declared the 12th of October Native American Day, the narrative is still implicitly being driven by Eurocentric ideas. I mean, what does it say to celebrate Native American Day on the day that Columbus arrived in the Americas? It's a really kind of ambiguous message. And in a world where Indigenous people are still more likely to be poorer, less well-educated, less healthy, and lacking in substantive political representation. These kinds of choices about anniversaries make them feel like they've been forgotten by their states as well as by history. Historical anniversaries aren't obvious. They are not predetermined or preordained. Anniversaries are chosen, usually by the people in charge. And so I think they serve a very specific narrative. They serve to tell a particular story. For me, this isn't just about history. This is about perpetuating a philosophy of dominance which prioritises one person's history above another's. Of course, we can't have anniversaries for everything. We'd be celebrating hundreds of things every day. But I do think that those of us involved in public history have a really serious responsibility not just to listen to the loudest voices or to choose the most popular events, but to represent those voices which are hardest to hear. So, of course, we should mark the centenary of the First World War, remember the millions of Europeans who fought and died in it. But perhaps we should also remember the thousands of Native Americans who fought in the First World War, or the millions of Americans who died as a result of European oppression. I think that only by recognising the multiple narratives which coincide at moments like Columbus Day can we use anniversaries to think about history in ways which really matter? Thank you very much. Great, so two very provocative uh, challenges to us, really, to, to make sure that we are acting in a way that's not perpetuating um, unequal relationships in the past into into the present. And I think it's interesting too in the museum and heritage sector how much that has become part of their work now as well. So if you take something like in the Science Museum, the Turing exhibition, which is really a kind of a restitution, you might say, for the way that he was treated at the time by the political elite. So next we have a last speaker who's probably got the hardest gig, not just being last in the list, but also taking us back in time to the era of Shalman. Now, is that how you um, pronounce it? It's a, 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 a Charlemagne. You are Charlemagne. a Charlemagne. Yeah, yeah. It depends whether you're American or British, I guess, too. So Dr. Charles West is lecturer in medieval history and he's a historian of the European Early Middle Ages. He's enjoyed being part of this AHRC project on the significance of the centenary. But as I said, he's going to, I think, take us to a very different kind of cultural um, challenges um, in the marking of the duo decentenary of Charlemagne. Thank you. <laughs> well, I think we can agree that anniversaries are in. Um, Helen mentioned two and a half thousand hours of BBC programming coming your way. Um, a back of the envelope calculation suggests that's enough for three months um, of 24 hour listening and viewing. Okay, so you know, if you want to know how you can spend uh, the time between now and Christmas, you know, you, you've got that sorted. But if, in case that's not enough commemoration for you, don't worry, um, the government, the Conservative government recently announced this heritage lottery fund called the Anniversaries Fund, which is going to pour, or rather earmark, 10 million pounds into commemorating more anniversaries. Okay. Now, the government very helpfully actually gave examples of the kinds of anniversaries which might be commemorated through this fund. And as an early medievalist, I was a bit disappointed that chronologically they start at 1215. Uh, for me, that's so recent. But the HLF fund is open to suggestions. It's very important to stress that. So there's nothing stopping me from bidding, for example, to commemorate the year 813. 
Uh, you're probably wondering what happens in the year 813. Well, that is when King, that's when, when King Egbert of Wessex, I'm sure you know this already, quote, spread devastation in Cornwall from east to west. Okay, so you know, there's still time actually for me to get in touch with the Cornish Tourist Board, I think. We might be able to get something together. But actually, is it the job of historians uh, like me, or indeed like this panel, to get involved in uh, anniversary celebrations? And let, let, let's look a little bit more closely at some of the language that's been used about them uh, in recent weeks. I'm going to focus actually on the, the BBC um, press release um, when it, it launched this, this two and a half thousand hours. Quote, there's a single idea uh, behind everything you will see and hear about World War I, and it is this. No other event in our history has had such a dramatic impact on who we are. Now, what I think that takes, what that text makes quite clear, and actually what lots of the other papers have been making quite clear, is that anniversaries are like birthdays. Yeah? They're fundamentally present-centred exercises. Yeah? They're about those bits of the past that speak to us, whoever us is. They're those bits of the past that make us who we are. Historians, by contrast, and I want, to op I want to open up a division here, when they write about the past, they try to understand it on its own terms. Of course the present impinges on what historians do, that's why history keeps on changing, that's why you've got to keep on buying Tim's new books. <laughs> but what's happening here is that the changing present is throwing up new questions about the past. It's not about how the past is legitimate in the present. Now, you might be sitting there thinking, you know, well, this is just a medievalist kind of sour grapes. You know, here's the, uh, the marginalised medievalist trying to spoil the party, right? But actually, even if the next few years don't look particularly propitious for, uh, for anniversary material for an English early medievalist, you know, say 813, who knows? Who knows? Who knows? Um, actually, early medievalists like me are quite well placed in general terms to make sweeping comments about the relevance <laughs> of their field. My period, for example, is the one when ethnic identities like Englishness come into existence. It's actually when Europe becomes a cultural reality, and I guess I'll point to Tim's comments about how important Clovis was for France. But I don't study it because they're my cultural or biological ancestors. What this boils down to then, I think, is that there's a really pressing need to distinguish between memory, whether it's collective or personal, and history. Doing history is an intellectual activity. Um, it's about thinking, it's, about, it's not about emoting. It's about creating knowledge. In some countries, I think it's worth stressing actually, history isn't part of the humanities at all, right? It's part of the social science. Uh, uh, kind of uh, group of disciplines, and that's actually a classification for which I've got a lot of sympathy. Don't get me wrong, I'm not opposed to anniversaries or commemorations, you know, far from it, right? Commemorating, it's natural, it's a natural human thing to do. Uh, just like family history, right? There's nothing inherently wrong with looking for identity in the past, of course there's not. But I think it's important to point out that that is not what historians are here for, right? Our job is to, ch is to understand change over time and to try and explain it. It's not to um, celebrate, or for that matter, to lament. Our job is to be critical and to challenge, it's not to monumentalise. So I think we do need to resist demands that we legitimise ourselves in the eyes of our political masters by changing what we do, um, as opposed to, by the way, reaching out through public history, which is different. I think we need to resist the, any attempts to represent history departments in general as kinds of heritage centres. <clears throat> not because heritage isn't valid, of course it is, it's just because it's different from history as a discipline. You know, just like birthday parties are different from um, serious biographies, that so they're both about kind of individuals. And in these we's, I've been using we's now, I mean, of course, this panel, but I actually mean you as well as history students. It's worth pointing out, by the way, cynically, let's be cynical about it, that what makes history students employable, right, at the end of their degree, isn't their service as faithful custodians of the nation's past, right? Am I advocating a total distinction, a total divorce between histories and anniversaries? No. Even if their frame of reference is fundamentally presentist, not historical. And historical, sorry, heritage activities need the truth claims of historians, right? The truth claims legitimated precisely by that critical distance from the past in order to have any traction. So, for example, um, there are lots of debates, quite interesting debates, moment as to whether the Battle of Hastings really took place. Uh, where the Battle of Hastings is thought to have taken place, right? English heritage is concerned by this kind of thing. Conversely, historians have also been known to try and use this anniversaries as hooks, of course, to try and, you know, get the public into their debates. But actually, I want to draw another... I want to finish, really, by drawing on another kind of connection. Actually, the history of anniversaries itself is quite an interesting story to be told. Anniversary commemorations are not actually totally new. Of course, they're not. But, you know, they do seem to be pressing on us uh, thick and fast at the moment. And to adopt that present-minded perspective, what does it say about modern Britain, um, or about the modern world, and for that matter? 
that it's apparently so interested, so fascinated in what is fundamentally a very two-dimensional approach to the past, which measures that past in round numbers according to its distance from the present day. The answer to that question, I think, might not be terribly flattering, um, but I think it might be quite revealing. Thank you. Possibly we can all go home now. That was absolutely fantastic. Much uh, more improving than the usual In Our Time panel. This is In Our Time Sheffield style, where everybody got to speak for quite a long time without being interrupted, which is great. But we'd like some interruptions from, from you now. If you've got any pressing questions or if we've got some pressing tweets we can attend to, people who've uh, asked questions, please um, make yourself make yourself known. I guess none of us can be very complacent now about our jobs as historians in the public realm, can we? we? I think the discussions here have shown what kind of responsibilities we might all have. Any questions? So you've all had your fill of <laughs> thinking. Okay. I want, I want to ask, I mean, obviously there's been quite a bit of critique here of the kind of some of the, the more the, the public narratives of commemoration. A lot of people said, you know, these are very problematic, they have political agendas and such like. So, okay, um, we're historians. Should we engage that? How should we approach engaging with these official narratives? You know, should we, when, you know, if we're, we're approached by a governmental organisation or by the BBC or by somebody, you know, somebody else to get involved in these things, you know, how do you negotiate that? How do you, you know, at what point do you say, no, I'm not happy to be an advisor on this project, or I am happy to be an advisor on this project? You know, how do you make that ethical decision? And are these organisations as monolithic as, if you're on the outside, you might think that they are? Um, I think that's a great that's a great question. Would would the um, all of those at this end of the table who have been dabbling in the First World War to a greater and lesser, probably quite a great extent, like to 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 answer. Should we start at the end of the table? Um, I think it's really difficult because um, places like I do, Brum do have historians on their on their boards and mm -hmm. on advisory groups for exhibitions. But at the end of the day, they're working to an agenda, and they're working to a funder, and they are, although not government organisations, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're a national museum and so I think it, it's, it's a really fine line between historians being historians but actually having to <coughs> toe the line if you like um, and I don't really know what the answer is to, for IWM, from IWM's point of view they have had the same historians on their um, advisory group throughout the whole of the project um, but conversely when they um, talk to people about the old First World War exhibition, the most popular bit of that exhibition was the trench experience, um, which if anybody's been you'll know, but it's a walk through um, a reconstructed trench which everybody at the museum and the historians wanted to get rid of, but felt that actually they would have to pay lip service at least um, to this exhibit. So it will be interesting to see next year what actually they have done with that. Um, I don't know whether that really answers your question. I, d I think ethically, it's um, it's difficult. Um, I think in my experience, um, the sort of institutions, if you like, that I've been dealing with so far have been um, sort of the, the local media, um, BBC Radio Sheffield. Um, so it's been it's been more of a media thing at the minute rather than sort of like you know local government or something like that, for example. Um, so, you know, as, as I sort of mentioned in my talk, I was quite concerned that we would highlight some of these, you know, the more difficult issues in terms of um, the centenary. Um, and also, you know, centred around Sheffield, Edward Carpenter, I mentioned before, there's, a, there's an inroad to think about gay history and, and, and gay history in terms of the war as well through that. Um, and that's, you know, my, my own research <coughs> interest as well. So I was, you know, hoping to be able to talk about that. But actually, that's sort of why I've been approached in some ways. Mm -hmm. And what I've found that I was quite surprised about is that they are quite concerned to bring out some of these more controversial elements or potentially, in their words, more interesting elements um, <laughs> that might sell a newspaper or might get people to listen to the radio. Um, because, you know, I had a conversation with the journalist who said, you know, well, 
I don't, I'm not, I'm concerned I don't just want the same story over and over again. You know, we've got all the stories about, you know, whoever going off to the trenches tell me something different, um, which I found quite surprising. So I've not come up against that challenge yet. Um, in terms of a specific example of sort of the, po the political controversies around what historians do, um, the way in which the 1798 rebellion in Ireland was commemorated in 1998 is a really good example of that. So this is a rebellion which took place in 1798. It's sort of a loose coalition between northern Presbyterian radicals and southern Catholic radicals, I suppose. Um, and there's a, a series of engagements and they're eventually crushed by the British and local yeomanry. Um, and in 1998, this was the 200th anniversary of this rebellion, and the government, the Irish government, put a lot of money into commemorating it, and there was like a seven-point programme along which historians had to sort of frame their contributions. And the things that they were interested, the government were interested in emphasising was this um, sort of cooperation between Northern Presbyterians and Southern Irish Catholics. Obviously in 1998, the Good Friday Agreement has just been signed. There's a whole dialogue around reconciliation between the two traditions. Um, and some historians participated in this kind of public history of, of 1798. Other historians pointed out that actually things are a bit problematic. And you know there are kind of grotesque sectarian massacres in 1798. And they are, their voices, those historical voices of those historians are totally excluded from the sort of official narrative of how that was commemorated publicly. And the types of historians who, who did raise their hands got a lot of flack and were considered to be you know, not helpful to the national project of reconciliation. So I think that was a kind of learning curve for some historians and um, you know, accusations of being, you know, are you a fellow traveller of republicanism? Are you a fellow traveller of you know, violent loyalism? It gets nasty um, and people get bruised. Can I, I can uh, continue on this. Just in, um, um, I haven't been asked that often to do uh, 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 centennial uh, stuff, although actually the Charlotte itself is coming up. Um, although what does remind me is, uh, reminds me of, I was involved briefly, there was, um, I think it was a centenary, some centenary of the discovery of the Bentley Grange helmet, um, which for those who don't know is an Anglo-Saxon helmet in the, in, in the museum. And I remember talking to journalists about it and I said, how interesting, you know, we can use this to show trade or whatever in the, in the 8th century. Um, and he sort of wrote this and said, so you're saying that Sheffield was a thriving centre at, you know, at the heart of world uh, uh, trade in the 8th? And I said, well, no. And I think this is, the, this is kind of your, your point, isn't it, Catherine? I mean, um, there are lots of agendas at play, and fundamentally, anniversary agendas are primarily, it seems to be, about simplification, right? It's about using hooks to say, look, here's a, here's a narrative we can all grab onto. Historians are really all about complexity. Mm -hmm. How do you mouth that up? And it seems to me, I think, in those negotiations you mentioned, you have to work out as historians whether or not this is an opportunity to provide complexity, in which case, go for it, or whether actually that is not going to be possible in this project, in which case, hands off. And sometimes it's complicated because you don't know ahead of time what the political agenda is behind this. So you're innocently doing your archival work and writing your history, and all of a sudden you discover that your work can be mobilized by someone. The, um, there was a debate in France a few years ago when, and I used to teach a course on the occupation of France, and so the students used to ask this question, right, can we define collaboration? But of course, collaboration in France is a crime for which you can be executed. So when you take a decision, this is collaboration, that has huge implications. And there was a, a famous court case where the, and the question was, can historians be expert witnesses in a court case for which someone's on trial for treason? I mean, this is a serious business. And some historians said, you, are you crazy? This isn't our job at all. Where others said, yeah, sure, here we are. <laughs> Put me on a witness, in the witness stand, yeah. So it, it's, it's but I think you can't, to try to avoid it is impossible. You can't not do history, or you could find a topic so obscure that nobody could possibly mobilize it, and that's great. But you don't want to do that either. You just, all you can be is aware of it, and realize that there are political implications to historical conclusions, and try to be conscious of it. Yeah, and, and I mean, I agree. I, like Charles, I don't get asked all that often to do <laughs> commemorations um, or celebrations or anniversaries or whatever it is you want to call them. But um, it, it seems to me that the question that's being asked doesn't apply just to anniversaries, but to any kind of history that you're asked to talk about on television or in a popular magazine or whatever it is or on the radio. And, and, and it's hugely shades of grey, isn't it? So it depends. A lot of it comes down to who's asking the question. So... Um, 
BBC History, I haven't always got the result that I wanted, but they tend to listen to what you're saying, where when I worked with a, an American company that shall remain nameless, I, I took my name off it in the end because they just wouldn't listen to a single thing I said and ended up creating a narrative about the Aztecs that was all about killing on an industrial scale. And I kept saying, you can't say that. That makes it sound like they're the Nazis. And I mean, and they had people throwing iron, what are those spiked balls on the chain? You, you, you know, maybe maces. 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 People with maces. And all that they couldn't possibly have had. And they just were, they were interested in a particular narrative about the progress of world history. And they didn't really care about the things that I cared about. Um, or whether it was true. Or whether it was true, <laughs> in fact. And, the, the, and so I guess that line differs from historian to historian. Um, and you weigh off the benefits of communicating what you want to talk about against the likely downsides. And if you do human sacrifice, there are some considerable downsides in terms of the way people want to present what you're talking about. Um, but but I, I don't think that's the question. The question you're asking is about anniversaries. I think it's about historians working with media people. And maybe it's more pronounced because of the kinds of national narratives and agendas that underlie anniversaries. But I don't think it's just about and my reflection would be that there are many, many platforms in the media, and some of it's also about matching your kind of skills and the, the narratives that you're working on to the right outlet in the media where you can keep control of your story, because that's what's in the end is how you can add to the public good. Um, and if you're not able to stick to your own ethical uh, your own kind of ethical metronome, then you know, you're just fucked, aren't you? And you'll never do it again. And I, I spend a lot of time at the moment because I'm kind of going out trying to find uh, new voices and new stories and encourage producers as well to be, to be listening and to, to be delving into these new stories, for, particularly for the commemoration of, of what will be over four years, not just till Christmas, the 2,500 hours of, of programming. And a lot of it will be local and regional. And so it's upskilling people and upskilling producers as well so that they again have that skill set to make those programs. And that's what we can do as professional historians. It's, it's, it's knowledge exchange, isn't it? It's saying to a producer, well, this is complex, but if you need an angle, because it's the only way we can make this, here's an angle that can work. Here's a microhistory that then can elucidate this big metaphorical point that you have to make, because that's the way that the narratives, in, particularly in TV, work. So we have to also understand how the media works, and I, I guess that's something I've been enjoying doing. So it's given me a job, but uh, I think putting yourself in an uncomfortable position ethically is is a place that none of us want to go and none of us need to go now. So we have a last question. It looks like um, a historiography question from for an exam for you all. Do you have uh, like HPS here? Do you have a historiography exam? Yeah. Uses oh, yes. of history. Uses yeah. of history, right. Well, here is notebooks out. Here is the big question. Uh, for all of you uh, to help you walk home feeling satisfied that you've been given a really meaty event tonight. So, are you ready for this? Is a function of anniversaries to encourage us to remember the past in order to forget the present? Classic exam question. Submitted by Twitter. Yes. <laughs> this is our pre submitted Twitter question. Almost an, an anonymous submission, I'd say. So, here we go. Is a function of anniversaries to encourage us to remember the past in order to forget the present? So, are we, are we going to carry on going in this chronological order, kind of down the table? Is that the fairest way to do it? Yeah, are you, okay. are you happy with that? Yeah, I'll do that. I'll do that. <laughs> a very quick... Um, Yes, depending on who you are. I think from the government's point of view with the First World War commemoration, it's a little bit of a distracting technique. Um, linking it to the Olympics and to the Jubilee, it's a kind of feel-good story that doesn't quite work, but if they try hard enough, then we'll forget all about what they're trying to do to um, the country and everyone will be happy with them. Thank you. <laughs> I was going to talk about the First World War as well, but yeah, pretty much. Um, I think that that can be quite true, but I also think that it can be used to examine what's going on at the moment, maybe use, like saying it's used as a hook to bring questions that are relevant still now. So when I was doing research into 
the Irish centenary and stuff about using this and using the hundred years as a time to like re-examine the way that people have come together and like things that are still relevant, like there's still problems between um, different groups. And so I don't, I would say that condemning them all to that would probably be a bit harsh. A typical thing on the fence answer. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, so thinking about it from a First World War um, perspective again then, um, I think, so if we think about where, where the anniversary is coming from in terms of the government, I have to agree with you know, what Amy said, you know, in terms of this idea of you know, this collective memory, um, thinking about it from that point of view, you know, we'll all pull together, we'll all remember this because you know, it's a positive. Um, I think yes, the answer to that is yes, you know, the question. But um, if we can, as we've all been talking about um, this evening, if we can use it to sort of problematise that a bit and to bring other histories and you know forgotten histories to the forefront through that, then I think that's where the benefit comes. So the answer to the question is yes, but if we keep a careful eye on it and you know, there are things we can do to actually you know make it useful. Yeah. Um, again, I, I sort of agree with the question, but sort of slightly twisting it, um, certainly from a kind of, from those who control, uh, from those who are in power, the functions of anniversaries is to remember the past in order to forget the present, but only so long as you can control how anniversaries go. And when anniversaries spiral out of control um, and, it, you know, go outside these sort of preordained tracks set down by governments and by those um, in charge of historical narratives, then things can degenerate rapidly. So. 1966 you have um 50th anniversary of the easter rising it all seems to be fine this has been going on for years and years and years every year it's commemorated um, but what happens is that shortly a couple of months after um the anniversary of the golden anniversary of the rising is that you have the refounding of paramilitary groups in northern ireland and the first murders um which kick off a whole 40 years of, of murder um, and that seems to be, these are murders committed by loyalist paramilitary groups, but seem to be responding um, particularly to a sort of anxiety around republicanism, where's republicanism going, we've had all these commemorations, we've had parades here, there and everywhere, all of a sudden we feel like we're under threat, we're going to lash out preemptively. So when anniversaries kind of escape government control, I think that's when they become problematic. Um, no. No, and the answer is no in two ways. Um, no, anniversary is not at all about forgetting the present. Um, they're about shaping the present, okay, which is a very different thing. That's right. Um, <laughs> idea. Yeah, I'm in the right place. Um, um, forgetting implies a kind of very passive, let's give it aside. Not at all. It, it's an active, active shape. Um, and no, um, um, I think actually anniversaries, I'm going to go out on the boat here and say no, anniversaries are about forgetting the past. Actually, um, it's about reducing the past to that, that to that flatness. It's about forgetting that real knowledge of the past is relational. It's about change over time. It's about these kinds of explanatory things. Um, so no, I don't think it is. Um, it's, if anything, it's not about forgetting the present. It's about forgetting the past. Um, and that's why I think historians' engagement has to be critical. In fact, I think our job is probably to de-anniversarise um, anniversaries. <laughs> That's what I wanted to say, <laughs> um, at least in part. Yeah, I mean, I think that it is that. It's not about forgetting the past. It's about instrumentalizing the or not about forgetting the present. It's about instrumentalizing the past in order to channel the present in a particular direction. Yeah, I, I was kind of going to say the same thing, which is that actually I think it's not. It's about remembering the past in order to reinvent the present, actually, as okay. well as using the reinvention of the past to reinvent the present. So. Um, in my work on Mexico, what happens is people reinvent the relationship of indigenous people to sacrifice, and they say, in fact, they didn't do it. They were really very civilized. It was only marginal. It was uh, invented by the Spanish in order to justify conquest. And by playing down that element of their history, they're then able to create a kind of unifying image of indigenous people, which everybody can can get behind as being the the what's the word the their spiritual ancestor or their cultural ancestor. They take out the ambiguity. So yes, I think it's about reinventing the past in order to kind of create a usable present, a usable past in the present. So I guess the question you just put down complexity and that about <laughs> answers the exam question. That, that was great, really, really helpful to hear all those voices. Um, I think we probably need a kind of a vote of thanks at the end, and maybe a vote, do you think the University of Sheffield should pay for all of us to go on a battlefields tour now? Because <laughs> we've all bothered to show up tonight. There are some people who didn't realise that this was actually an audition to see if you got on a free trip. So a round of applause.
Um, I'd just like to say thank you so much to everyone who's taken the time out of their day to come down to this event tonight, um, to staff, students and everyone who's um, a member of the public as well from outside the university. Um, it's the first time that the History Society has ever run um, a week-long programme of events and to see so many people interested in and willing to help with our events is so encouraging to us and we're so happy about it. Um, a special thanks goes to our incredible panel tonight, you were amazing. <laughs> Um, without whom this would have been impo impossible and thank you to the history department whose enthusiasm for this event has been unrivalled. <laughs> um, we're so pleased to have hosted Professor Weinstein tonight as well um, and for her to take time out of her busy schedule to come here is, is an honour really. Um, thank you to everyone who asked questions via Twitter and um, in the room um, and if anyone is interested in the rest of the um, programme for the rest of the week um, the first of which is on, is on Wednesday, um, comparing how Britain and Germany have remembered World War II. Um, then please don't hesitate to ask any of the committee which, uh, who will be around the room um, who have flyers and more information. Um, again, thank you so much for coming down tonight and have a safe journey home.